Hi everyone, Zach here, and welcome to the fourth lesson in this series, An Introduction to AI. In this lesson, we'll be exploring what finite state machines are. We won't be doing any work in Unreal directly, because I think it's important to explore this concept before we make our first finite state machine, or FSM. We will cover what an FSM is, we will talk about examples of finite state machines, and then we'll explore what behavior trees are in relation to finite state machines. So, a finite state machine is a model to define a finite number of states that transition amongst each other. So going from state one to state two and back from state two to state one. So going from state two to state three and back from three to two and from state three to state one and back to three. Now, Technically, you don't need to do the back and forth for each of these. You do need to be able to return to your default state. So let's look at an example of what that might be. So let's say we have a guard unit. This guard unit's default state is patrolling. The unit is always on patrol. They Then they can enter the state of chase. When chase is done, they could return back to patrolling or they could enter a state of attack. When the attack is done, assuming the enemy is destroyed and they're still alive, they can re-enter the state of patrolling. Now, there are a few more things to consider. We have to think about what transitions from that first state, patrol, into chase, and then what transitions back from chase to patrol, and with regards to attack and chase, and from attack to patrol. I already gave the example of attack to patrol, the enemy's been destroyed, and our unit's still alive. So, let's take a look at some of those potential conditions. So, we might, when we go from patrol to chase, have seen an enemy. We might go back from chase to patrol when we lose sight of the enemy. We might go from chase to attack if the enemy is near enough for us to attack. We might go back from attack to chase if the enemy is far away. Now, we might also, as I point out, go back to it from attack to patrol if the enemy is dead. This all seems fairly simple, right? We're making decisions based on certain conditions on what we are going to do. There are a finite number of states, in this case, three states. There are conditions to transition between the states that the AI is going to adhere to. So it checks, can I see the enemy? Yes, yes, I can. I'll chase it. Is the enemy nearby? Yes, I'll attack. Now, even there, there might be a limitation. What if the enemy just is nearby when they see them? They walk around a corner, and the enemy's right there. They enter a chase state to begin with, and then jump to the attack. We lose a bit of flexibility there. So we could connect actually patrol directly down to attack. So we could have it go both directions. Also, Coming off our attack, we need to consider, is there a death state? Do we want to trigger animations for death? And are there certain things that happen when the unit dies? Does it have certain dialogue? So these machines, we have to think about everything we want to do with them and start labeling them. And they, for that reason, can get a bit complex. So let's take our original model of the patrol chase attack. Let's say for a moment they hear a noise. And so we go from patrol to search or they lose sight of the enemy, and we don't want them to go back to patrol to begin with, but start searching. Then we have a new branch to our finite state machine. So now we have four finite states our AI can be in. Well, what happens if the enemy is scary, and they know they can't beat it? You know, it's a massive monster, and they're armed with a, you know, water gun. Well, they might go from chase to flee, realizing what they're chasing is much more powerful than them. Also, they could potentially go from that directly to patrol. They might be attacking and run out of ammo and thus 
don't have a way to fight and need to retreat to get more ammo. Alternatively, if they, you know, if their clip empties or their magazine empties and they have more ammo on them, they might need to reload and then return to attack. Well, maybe they realize there's a better position. Maybe they know their allies are nearby and decide to flank the enemy. Then they could either flank when they're attacking or after they reloaded. Now, actually, I'm slightly mistaken. I said they could flank when they were attacking. They would attack and then move to flank and then back to attack. And right there, there's that other limitation that I've been kind of hinting at is that you can't do two things at once. You can't attack and flank. You could write it so that move to flank involves shooting. You might have two different flank states where one is I'm able to shoot at the enemy safely or one is I want to do it stealthily. So you need to consider all those different combinations. And as you can start to see, a finite state machine can get really, really complex. Now, all of this said, if you're looking at this and you're very familiar with finite state machines, yes, there is a problem with this one. Flea doesn't return back to our default patrol state. So again, we need to return to that default state. Now, this particular model, you might have seen in a lot of video games from the early aughts or late 90s or parts of it even in more recent games. It is a fine system to have in place. It is, however, very limited. Think about that when you're playing a game, let's say Skyrim for a moment, and you shoot a bow while you're in stealth, and someone goes, oh, I heard a noise, and then patrols for a few moments, doesn't see anything, and then goes back to their idle state. This can be limiting in that regard as well, in that it might not seem realistic. Now, some of that is just for game design reasons. We need to be able to give the player an opportunity to continue. We also need to consider that eventually in real life if that happened okay yeah people are going to look into it weirdly but business as usual does resume at some point i'm sorry about the weird image of someone shooting a bow in real life now these systems are important to learn because they underpin how you have to start thinking about our ai systems and how we can start conceptualizing the conditions that we need to check before our AI moves to do something. So behavior trees and finite state machines are two of the more common methods you'll see tutorials on and some of the more common approaches you'll see people learning these materials use. There are more advanced systems like utility and gope. Um, for anyone who's played Fear, that is Gope. So their AI didn't use that system. It used a goal-based system. So I, I hear a lot of questions about behavior trees often. I just want to address three of them. We will explore behavior trees in greater depth later on. So the first question I hear often, is a behavior tree a finite state machine? Now, technically, a behavior tree is what's known as a hierarchical finite state machine. Now, I have seen people say that it isn't really a finite state machine. Well, there are a finite number of states the AI can be in, and it is hierarchical in nature where you can drill down via branches to do certain actions. Now, there is more flexibility in a behavior tree as you can run a number of processes in parallel. You don't need multiple finite state machines to run a behavior to run processes in parallel in a behavior tree you do need to run multiple finite state machines in parallel to achieve that same effect so why do we use behavior trees over fsm well as i just said we can run more complex tasks and behaviors in behavior trees we can have more lifelike choices from behavior trees than finite state machines. Now that's not entirely true. We can have really complex choices from finite state machines. We may need multiple finite state machines running in parallel, which becomes very, very resource intensive. We also, when we think about our finite state machines, might end up with a very confusing mess of spaghetti spilled all over the floor. 
Great example of this is looking at some animations for different states an AI can be in. By the way, the entire animation system within Unreal is a finite state machine. You have to label the conditions. Why does it transition from this one animation to this other animation? So these can get really messy, these finite state machines. They're a bit harder to work with then. They're much harder to debug, and they can be a lot more resource intensive. So the ease of which we can access the flexibility makes behavior trees superior to that regard. Also, again, because we can run them, we can run tasks in the behavior tree in parallel, whereas, whereas we would have to run multiple state machines in parallel to achieve the same effect. And finally, can you use both at once? Yes. A behavior tree is a highly modular finite, hierarchical finite state machine. You can actually trigger finite state machines within your behavior tree. You can call up a AI task at the finite state machine. In fact, if you follow the AI tutorial I do for the RTS tutorial series, there is a finite state machine that isn't clearly a finite state machine embedded in part of our status check. So that status check is a finite state machine being called up by the behavior tree. All right, all of that said, this series has been brought to you by my Patreon sponsors who voted for the topic on introduction to AI. If you'd like to help support the channel and have a voice on what topics I cover, consider becoming a supporter on Patreon. As always, if you've enjoyed this video, if you found it educational or helpful, hit that like button down below. And if you want to know when the video comes out where we will be making our first finite state machine together, go ahead and hit that subscribe and notify icon. And finally, as always, I look forward to seeing you in the next tutorial and I hope that you have a wonderful day.